the things that cripple our spiritual walk or the things that paralyze our prayer life. The things that cripple our spiritual walk or the things that paralyze our prayer life. You know, we are called to a life, an abundant life. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And we are called to have a life that is a spiritual life, a supernatural life, a life of power in prayer. Jesus said in John 14, 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And the next verse he says, verse 15, and if you love me, what is, what's the next verse? If you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, the other day, we Friday night, actually, we had a chance to have the youth and singles over our house uh, for a time of uh, worship, of uh, singing uh, Christmas hymns and, and worshiping the Lord, and a time of fun as well, of exchanging um, White, uh, white elephant gifts, which are usually, uh, you know, something that is uh, a gag gift, so to speak. And there was uh, one item that became the coveted white elephant gift and <laughs> that everyone was vying for because you can steal when you have when it's your turn. And that became the coveted thermos. And it was really a nice thermos that someone had bought uh, to give uh, give away in this uh, exchange program. And but anyways. <laughs> And we had an ugly sweater contest as well. And, and um, I did something kind of mean. Uh, my ugly sweater, I'll just tell you, my ugly sweater, I, I put a sweater on and then I attached a, a mirror to my chest. <laughs> and so, what is that? Well, it's my ugly sweater. Look, see. <laughs> you know, sometimes it, it took a moment for it to click in, and I see that most of you got it. But anyways, but anyways, before our worship, we were talking about, you know, the Lord coming and, and um, not just, the, you know, the greatest story ever told and the greatest gift to mankind wasn't just a, a babe in the manger, right? He grew up and he performed miracles and he walked uprightly in righteousness, doing the will of his heavenly father. And that will took him to the cross and he died on, his, on the cross that we may be forgiven our sins and have eternal life. You know, the greatest story ever told. But even salvation is still part of the story. Not only did he rise from the grave, but the scriptures tell us, especially in the book of Ephesians, that we've been raised with him to newness of life. Right? We've been raised with him in newness of life, that we are seated with him in the heavenly places in a position of power and authority. And we are encouraged to be partakers of his holiness. You know, he, he wants to save, he has saved us and redeemed us if you're trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ, but he also wants to change us and conform us to the image of his son. There is more to the story than just going to heaven. And we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. It's amazing that the Lord has made himself available to mankind. Not just once on the cross, but because he went to the cross, access has been opened up to us, right? The curtain has been ripped from top to bottom, and we can go before the throne boldly, the scripture says. Boldly, Hebrew says, we can go before the throne of grace and receive grace and mercy in the time of need. We have access to the throne of God, creator of everything that is before us, even the things that we cannot see, and all of the resources of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, are made available to us because Christ went to the cross. And because of his blood, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And because of that, we can have a powerful, impactful, effectual, supernatural prayer life because Christ is in you, and he is in me if you are born again by the Spirit of God. So that curtain separating us from the axis of the throne of God has been ripped from top to bottom, and we are invited to come and to spend time in his presence. You know, the Lord says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 33, 3, 
Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show you great and mighty things, things that you know not, or things that you do not know. The implication here is that uh, he wants to show us things that we know not, or beyond our imagination, things that are supernatural and powerful in God. And uh, we are called to power and, and vir virtue, and we are called to be partakers of his divine nature in Christ. And we, he wants to work in us and work through us to have an effect on this world, this earth that we are now in. Uh, we know of um, James chapter 5, it speaks of Elijah, the prophet Elijah. And it says uh, of James 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Right? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He goes on in James 5, 17, Elijah was a man subject to the like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by a space of three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gained rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. The point of the story that James was sharing here, that Elijah was an ordinary person. He was an ordinary man who prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered his prayer. And we are called to have an effective, powerful prayer life. But there, if we, there are things that will cripple our spiritual walk. There are attitudes and motivations that if we allow into our lives, they will cripple our spiritual walk. And the devil knows that if he can paralyze God's people, he can gain the upper hand. If we stop praying, he gains the upper hand. If we stop fighting, if we stop waging war, if we acquiesce and stop um, going to battle, he, Satan, gains the upper hand. If we are not engaged in a, the spiritual warfare that we are in, he gains the upper hand. And this morning I want to share some characteristics um, that are found in the book of James, James chapter 4. If you want to turn there, that's where we're going to be uh, spending the rest of the morning. James chapter 4, some characteristics that cripple our spiritual walk, that paralyze our prayer life. In James 4, verse 1, it says, From whence come wars and disputes among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. And all, many of us are familiar with that scripture. First, look at the things that he says in verse 1. He's talking about wars and disputes and fightings. And oftentimes, uh, when we think of uh, a carnal mind or carnality, we think of a mind or a person who has their focus, their attention on the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those sorts of things. But it, Paul explains carnality and a carnal, carnal mind in 1 Corinthians 3.1. 3, 1. 3, 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as carnal even as unto babes in Christ. He goes on to say, I, ha I have fed you with milk and not with meat or solid food, for unto now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able to receive it. So he's basically saying you're a baby and you're still a baby. <laughs> he wants them to grow up. He goes, for you are still carnal. So he's speaking to Christians, he's speaking to Christians in the body of Christ, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? According to the Apostle Paul, envy, strife, divisions, contentions is carnality. For while one says, I am of Paul, another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who then is Apollos? but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Verse 6, I have planted, Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that plants anything, or neither is he that waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to what he has labored. For we are laborers together with God, and you are God's field, and you are God's building. 
The Apostle Paul is making it very clear that there is to be no contention, no strife, no fighting, backbiting, gossiping, you name it, in the body of Christ. If we want to have a powerful, effectual prayer life, if we want to see Calvary Christian Church to grow, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we want to see the blessing of God upon this ministry, all strife, all contention, all division must come to an end. All backbiting, all gossiping must stop for the sake of the body of Christ. If we want to see the manifestation of the power of God, if we want to grow up and stop being babies and being carnal, and we want to be spiritual men in the kingdom of God, all envy, jealousy, contentions must stop, according to the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians, he talks about that we are one body and that we are members of one body. One baptism, one spirit, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are one in Christ. Right? We are one in Christ. Therefore, there shall not be divisions among us for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ. Let's continue on. If we we have not, because what we... We ask not, we have not, because I believe we believe not. That's the next thing. And it's amazing to me that indifference in the body of Christ, indifference, a great paralyzer in the body of Christ, you have not because you ask not, oftentimes because of indifference. You care not. Indifference. And we are living in the greatest time, really, I believe, um, as far as the greatest time of the revelation or understanding or the preaching of the gospel of God in human history, because there are more preachers than ever before. There are more books than ever before. There is more gospel-saturated media, media than ever before. If you're, whatever you're talking, movies or the internet or podcasts, it's all out there as far as gospel-saturated media, more than any time in the history of man. And yet people are struggling with discouragement and dis- disillusion and confusion among the body of Christ. And oftentimes we have not because we ask not because we become indifferent. People can go from seminar to conference to conference, concerts to programs. They can watch YouTube videos and still remain indifferent to the gospel of Christ. And most often time, the, the church's response when we go through a time of indifference uh, or we see um, apathy in the body of Christ, well, let's have more programs, right? More programs. <laughs> Uh, so that uh, we can hopefully build up the faith in, in the, a person's heart or life. But oftentimes what we need to do as individuals, we need to f- feed ourselves on the Word of God. We need to be in the Word of God for ourselves. We see so little power and we see so little victory. We see so little deliverance in the body of Christ because of unbelief. And we see so much unbelief is because we're not staying upon the word of God. We're not spending time in his word. We're not daily feeding ourselves on the living word, the word of God. There are wonderful and precious, powerful promises in God's word, but we must find them for ourselves. We must find ourselves in the word of God, reading it, believing it, and praying according to the word of God, right? We need to grow up and stop being babes and stop being spoon-fed, so to speak. Here you go. Here's your little dose. And we need to come to the word of God and be able to read the word of God for ourselves and believe it and pray it uh, into existence. To fight against indifference, we have... And in order to have a more powerful and, again, effective and, and, and impactful prayer life, we need to spend time washing our minds in God's word. 
quite, it's very simple. We need to spend time washing our minds in God's word. You know, again, there are numerous ministries with all kinds of um, programs and activities. Uh, not too long ago, I was uh, had an opportunity to go to a, another church, um, and uh, afterwards, I, I looked them up on the internet, and I looked up their website, and it's like, oh my, on Thursdays, they have square dancing. On Fridays, they have line dancing. On Saturday, you can uh, go to the, bu- the pub, and it's called uh, Beer and the Word of God, or something like that. And I'm thinking, oh, so many activities, but very little having to do with the Word of God. There's a myriad of activities in the modern church, but very little learning of God's word. We need to be those that love God's word, that hide God's word in our heart, that love to read it for ourselves, that love to hear it and to hear and to listen under the anointing of God's word being preached. Indifference grows in the heart and the soul that is not being nurtured by the word of God. Indifference grows in the heart and the soul of the individual that is not, uh, heart and soul not being nurtured by the word of God. And again, if you're not giving yourselves to God's word, if you're not listening to God's word, if you're not trying to understand and and, uh, comprehend God's word, you are basically giving yourself over to indifference and unbelief. The body of Christ is suffering from a famine The scripture says in the book of Amos, and that's why we have so little faith and so little power in the church, because it is a famine of the word of God. Amos 8.11, behold, the day shall come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor thirst of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord, hearing the word of the Lord. There is the word of the Lord is out there. The word of the Lord is out there, and it's and if you look for it, you'll find it. But we have to hear what the Lord is saying. We have to listen and obey the scripture. We have to have an attitude of heart of listening to what actually the word of God is saying. And if you're not feeding yourself on the word of God, then you will be feeding yourself on something else to replace it. But it's not something that's going to nourish your soul, right? It's not something that's going to strengthen the inner man and build you up in the holy faith. One of the uh, things about anorexia is a person who's suffering from anorexia, even though they may be totally malnourished and on the, the, the brink of death, I mean, just basically a bag of bone, skin and bone, um, and they have starved themselves to that, situ- that, that point in their lives, um, they lose the hunger for food. They lose the desire to eat. And I believe maybe in, in many cases that is where some people are in the body of Christ. They've lost the desire for God's word because of malnutrition, because they have not been feeding themselves on God's word. And it's ironic that with the advancement of all this technology and the internet, Christians and Christians today have the greatest opportunity to study God's word and yet to hear God's word and to read God's word and to meditate on God's word. And yet we are experiencing a spiritual famine in the body of Christ. Confusion. Many people are confused and ignorant of God's word. Recently, uh, I, I did something that I don't normally do. There was one fellow who was a, a friend of a friend on Facebook, and he was talking about, oh, it's so difficult. He, he put it out there, so difficult to, to read God's word when you're a logical person. And I'm like, well, I'm going to answer this fellow and, and, in a kind way. And I said, I said, well, actually, you know, the Bible is very logical and very orderly. And the problem is, is that it is spiritual, right? And it can only be be discerned by the spiritual mind. And in fact, um, the scripture tells us in John that it says the word, what became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word for word is the Greek word logos, which means logic. He didn't bite. (laughs) Maybe you need some help understanding the word of God. No comment. Did he really want the word of God or did he just want to complain? 
Distractions. With the advancement of technology comes distractions, doesn't it? The, the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this, wor this world uh, snuff out the life of Christ that is within you if you allow it. And through the internet, I, be I believe that in many cases that we are being programmed, whether we believe it or not, to not sit still, to not be quiet, to not meditate, to not think about God's word, and to not wait upon the Lord. We are being programmed not to think, especially to think about God's word. I took an informal survey um, of the youth um, some time ago, and I asked them a simple question. Would you rather watch a video uh, about a, a story or read the story? Read it for yourselves. And 100% of them, I think, said they would rather watch. Well, that's a problem. See, they're being programmed to watch videos rather than to search the scriptures to see if these things are true, to search the scriptures to see if these things are true for themselves. And even I find myself, and I'll, I'll ask you a question, and see if it's just me, or is it uh, the majority of people here? If you see a video, and it's a Christian video, advertised, and the first thing I do is I look how much time. Is it 10 minutes, three minutes, 30 minutes, two hours? How long is this video? The second thing I do, if it's more than three minutes, it's too long. Does anyone do that? Skip it. Just a couple people are, are ADD. <laughs> right? It's too long. I ain't got time for that. What are we doing? We're being programmed. Even when it comes to, it could be a wonderful, powerful message from God's word. But if it's more than three minutes, I don't have time for that. Of course, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at Megan, Mary with a whole bunch of kids. She definitely doesn't have time for that. A whole bunch of little ones running around unless it's late at night when they're in bed, right? But I'm doing it because I believe the effect of having instant, immediate, short messages is really, I believe, destroying the foundation of the body of Christ, it is something that is eating away at the foundation because the scripture tells us, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Those that wait upon the Lord, Lord, we need the Lord to teach us to wait. I mean, in the Old Testament, the people would sit in the desert, desert heat for half a day and listen to someone read the scriptures word for word, verbatim. You might think that I'm the least interesting speaker you've ever heard, but can you imagine sitting in the desert heat and so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so and they sat there and they listened and they took it in because why? It was the word of God. When Jesus was here and when he preached in Mark 8, there, there's a story that he was teaching a very great multitude. And this very great multitude had listened, sat and listened to Jesus preach for three days without eating anything. Wow, three days. Of course, that was they were listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't listening to one of us. Paul states plainly that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we want to have effectual, fervent prayer, powerful prayer, we must find ourselves dining at the Lord's table, eating his word, digesting his word, hearing his word. Whether it comes through listening or reading, we must be those that are believing and trusting and acting upon God's word. We must be those that are eating our daily bread if we're going to have the power of God operating in our lives. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan, what did he do? When Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, what did he do? He answered with God's word. And he said in Matthew 4, 4, the Lord answers and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is to be our sustenance, is to sustain us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, against the enemy. And Jesus, when he quoted this, he was quoting from Deuteronomy. He was quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 1, all the commandments which I command you this day, you shall observe to do. 
It wasn't something they were just supposed to listen to, but they were supposed to be doers of the word. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land, that you may be strong and mighty in word and in deed, which the Lord had promised your fathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and suffered you to hunger, and he fed thee with manna which you knew, did not know, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord does man live. That's what Jesus was quoting from. He fed them the manna, but it was, listen, you don't live by bread alone. You live by the word of God. So I encourage you, if you are discouraged, if you are depressed, you, if you feel weak and disillusioned, if your prayer life is pathetic, the Lord says, I have given you my word. I have given you my word, feed upon it, strengthen it and nourish yourself, strengthen and nourish your inner man upon the word of God. All we need is God's word to drive out unbelief and indifference. I urge you to hear it, to trust it, to obey it, and to rest in it. With indifference comes, indifference comes when we fail to remember God's goodness. Indifference comes when we fail to remember God's goodness. And again, this is indifference is a paralyzer to our prayer life. Even in the scripture that I just read in Deuteronomy, it says, remember all the things that the Lord thy God has done for you. In Psalm 106, verse 7, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his namesake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as though through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies and there was not one of them left. Then believe, they believed thy words and they sang his praise. They forgot God their savior, which had done great things in Egypt. And again, that generation of Israelites, they saw the plagues, right? They saw the blood of the Nile. They saw the, the frogs, the lice, the flies, the livestock, diseased, diseased livestock, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, and the death of the firstborn in Egypt. They walked, they watched the mighty hand of God outpouring his wrath upon Egypt. And they personally experienced God's provisional hand, providential hand of deliverance and salvation. They were the recipients of God's faithfulness and his love and his mercy and his goodness. They were the apple of his eye. And he brought forth deliverance and salvation unto them. But as soon as they get to the Red Sea, Exodus 14, when they're trapped by sea and sword, they forget God's goodness and mercy that brought them out. They forgot his goodness. And an act of God's loving kindness and tender mercies, he intervenes and he parts the Red Sea for his namesake. He already told them that he was going to do that, and he does it. And millions of Israelites crossed over the Red Sea, walking on dry ground, so to speak. And that was probably an 11-mile expanse. They walked, walking on dry ground, millions. And that generation of Hebrews, they observed Pharaoh and his army right, crushed, drowned by mountains of water collapsing down upon them. Egypt was completely decimated to rise no more. 400 years of slavery had ended. 400 years of slavery, slavery was no more. They were no longer subject to the tyrant Pharaoh. They were delivered from the oppressor. They would no longer suffer the pain of the whip upon their backs. They were free free from oppression, free from injustice, free from tyranny, free from slavery. They were free at last. And yet they were quick to forget their God. They were quick to forget their deliverer. They were quick to forget their redeemer, their savior. But before we judge them too harshly, what about us? 
I mean, prior to salvation, Scripture makes it very clear that we were dead in our trespasses and sin, that we were subjects of the prince of the power of the air, that we were in bondage to sin, and that we were slaves in Satan's kingdom. The Scripture makes it clear that prior to salvation in Christ, we were by nature children of wrath and children of disobedience. In Ephesians 2, 4, but God intervened. God interjected himself into humanity. God interrupted the, and disrupted the course of history and the course of our lives. But God, who is rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ. And by grace you are saved. And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.13 says it this way, God, who delivered us from the power of darkness, has translated us or transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Prior to salvation, we were without Christ. We were aliens. We were foreigners from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, and we had no hope without God in the world. We were far from God. In fact, we were his enemies. We could not save ourselves. We could not deliver ourselves. We could not do anything to earn our salvation. We could not deliver ourselves from destruction and eternal damnation. We had the sentence of hell hanging over our heads. We were weighed in the scales of God's justice and found guilty. And the verdict was eternal, unending condemnation. We could not save ourselves by works of righteousness that we have done, but we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. But God interceded. God interceded upon our behalf. He paid the penalty for our sin, and we have been brought nigh to the Lord Jesus Christ by the blood of Jesus. We have been redeemed, forgiven, justified, and sanctified. And we, are, we were, however, rightly and justly deserving the sentence of death because of our sin. But God, in his infinite mercy, stepped in and intervened in our lives. When Jesus died on the cross, he delivered us from darkness, sin, death, the tyranny of the oppressor, Satan, the judgment of hell. He delivered us from our enemy and brought us into his kingdom. And today... We are free. May we never forget his kindness towards us. May we never be those that forget his goodness and his grace, which he has manifested towards us. Jeremiah asked a ridiculous question in Jeremiah 2.32. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? And the obvious answer is, of course not. A bride would never forget her wedding dress on her wedding day. And most young ladies are usually planning their wedding from the time they are six, five years old. Most guys are completely clueless, but uh, most gals have it all planned out. We did actually have one, one bride who forgot her shoes on her wedding day, but it worked out. Jeremiah is asking a question. Would a bride forget her attire? Absolutely not. And then he goes on to say, yet my people have forgotten me days without number. We forget him days without number. And then we struggle in our prayer life. We wonder why it's so lackluster. We wonder why, what happened, what's wrong. We allowed indifference to seep into our lives. We allowed unbelief and indifference we become careless in not spending time worshiping the Lord, his goodness, his love, and his mercy. John Bunyan said, he that runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. How true that is. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said that Jesus went more readily to the cross than we go to the throne of grace. Let that sink in. That Jesus... For the joy that was set before him went more readily to the cross than we take the time to go to the throne of grace. We have not because we ask not because of indifference, unbelief, and we 
remember not. We forget the Lord's goodness. And when we're satisfied with the things of this world, and we are living in a mediocre, lukewarm existence, we forget God. It's because we've forgotten God. It's because we're not in his word. When Spurgeon was asked what was the secret to his spiritual power, his response was, knee word, my brethren, knee word. Oh, that our prayers would be so powerful that they would affect nations. Mary, the Queen of Scots, said, I fear John Knox's prayer more than an army of 10,000 men. Oh, if God's people would rise up in believing prayer, we would see the walls come down of division and strife in the nation. We have not because we ask not, and we ask not because oftentimes we are simply too busy with the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this world. We don't spend time in the word recounting the great things that God has done. We have lost our focus. Our focus is on the temporal things rather than on the eternal things. The important things are the eternal things. Every revival that I have studied uh, was birthed through prayer. Every revival that I know of was birthed in prayer. It didn't just happen, you know, oh, it just happened. We were just walking one day and boom, revival hit. It was birthed in prayer. And if we want revival in our homes, in our families, in our extended families, in our neighborhoods, our factories, we need to get busy in the prayer closet. We need to be serious with God. John, Jonathan Edwards' revival started with prayer. Charles Finney, when he would go and preach, he would spend a night praying and fasting and seeking God, crying out in the woods, in the wilderness. One time after crying out all night, he went and he preached to an a irreligious people, an indifferent people, an uncaring people. And as he was speaking, the conviction of the Holy Spirit fell upon the congregation, so much so that people were uh, kneeling down and crying out to God in forgiveness, so much so that Finney stopped preaching and allowed the Holy Spirit to work. Revival is birthed in prayer. The businessmen's revival of 1857 to 1858 started through prayer. A man was called upon to lead prayer in New York City, and he decided to... um, open a church once a week for, for prayer at noontime. Well, the first meeting was set for September 23rd, three weeks before the bank panic of 1857, and six attended the first week. 20 attended the next week. Then 40 people attended the week after that, and then they, had to, they switched to daily meetings. Before long, all the space was taken in the church and other churches Then other churches began to open up their doors and have prayer meetings every day at noon. Revivals broke out over everywhere in 1857, spreading throughout the United States and the world. Some have called it the Great Prayer Meeting Revival of 1857. It's estimated that a million people gave their lives to Christ because of that prayer meeting. Even more significant, a, a million to 400 million, or I'm sorry, 4 million, that were already attending church actually got saved. May God lay on our hearts a burden of prayer. May God deliver us from those things that cause or that paralyze us as indifference. Next, we see in James, James 4, 3, you ask not and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your lusts. Indifference leads to indulgence. Indulgence cripples our spiritual life. Indulgence paralyzes our prayer life. When he says you pray amiss refers to you pray in an evil manner, motivated by personal gain and personal gratification, selfish desires. So much for the health, wealth, and prosperity movement. As Christians, we are to be seeking first his kingdom, right? And his righteousness. We are to be seeking to glorify God and to 
glorify God in our prayer life. We are to be seeking for his namesake. Lord, for your namesake, do such and such. For your namesake, move, O oh God. We can have a powerful prayer life, but we must understand that prayer is not a tool to bend God's hand to our desires. The key, a secret to a powerful prayer life is found in the word submission. Submission to the will of God. Surrender to the will of God. Surrender to the King of Kings, looking for his honor, for his namesake, for his glory, that he would be glorified through our prayers. Effective, fervent prayer is found in seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus taught after this manner that we should pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we want to see God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, let us pray and bring heaven to earth. Let us pray through our prayers, bring heaven to earth and see God's will be done. Jesus prays <clears throat> before the cross at Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 39, and he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, probably the most powerful words in all of history, nevertheless, not my will, but thou, yours be done. Not my will, but thou be done. And this should be the same for us, right? We should be seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. We should be seeking to do his will. And oftentimes we have to pray it into existence before we walk in it. It's amazing that this is the place that Jesus um, picked to pray. I didn't realize this until recently, that this was a place of um, basically a crossroads. When um, in 2 Samuel 15, 30, when David was being attacked by Absalom, and David was fleeing for his life from Jerusalem, he went through the Mount of Olives on his way to the Judean, Judean countryside. It was a route of escape. So here Jesus is at a crossroads, maybe looking over to the Judean countryside, knowing that the cross is before him. Lord, Heavenly Father, not my will, but thy will be done. It was David's escape route, but it was Christ's journey to the cross. In his moment of betrayal, Jesus prayed to his Heavenly Father and proclaimed those words, those, those hell-shattering words, not my will, but thine be done. And so it should be for all of God's people. And we know that this place is significant because Jesus, when he returns, he is coming to the Mount of Olives, the place of the crossroads, the place, Gethsemane, of the crushing of the olive to bring forth the oil of the olive. Jesus was concerned about fulfilling the will of the Father. He lived in the audience of one, and his desire was to glorify his Father in heaven. And that was evident in his life and in his prayer life. The Bible tells us, speaking of indulgence, not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but, but he that does the will of God abides forever. In our prayer life, we need to be concerned with God's will, God's plans, God's purposes, God's glory. We need to be pursuing his honor and his glory in our personal lives. Again, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, Gethsemane, the olive press. All of us, I, I believe, that our Christians will face our own Mount of Olives, our own Gethsemane, our own crossroads, where we'll have an opportunity to deny ourselves, take up our cross, or flee to the Judean countryside. Again, we can escape our burden or we can take it up by the power, by the grace of God, and do the will of God. Your personal walk with God, your personal holiness, 
affects your prayer life. Your personal holiness affects your prayer life. James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's the next verse. And that word, a righteous man, literally means an obedient man. An obedient man. Your personal holiness, your personal walk with God, your personal obedience affects your prayer life. Jesus said it this way, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples indeed. Abide means to stay, to continue, to dwell, to endure, to be present, to remain, to stand, to tarry in God's word, in God's will. Next, so we have indifference, indulgence. James 4, 3, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world, and friendship means there's a special fondness or affection, a love, an emotional attachment, is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. We cannot think that we can straddle the fence, having one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and expect to have a powerful prayer life. We cannot expect to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus if we have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Paul says in Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There's no bones about it that if we love the world and the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we are making ourselves an enemy of God. We can't have a powerful prayer life because sin causes paralysis. Sin cripples our prayer life. Even the secret sin that we think that we're getting away with. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. To regard iniquity means that you know that the sin is there and that you look at the sin with fondness. You protect it, you keep it secret from others rather than confessing it, rather than forsaking it, rather than repenting and turn from it. You love it and you cherish it. Isaiah 59.1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Proverbs 28, 9, He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Proverbs 15, 8, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Proverbs 15, 29, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Peter quotes from Psalm 34, 15, and 16, in 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Listen, your personal life matters. Your personal holiness matters. Your personal walk with God matters. And it is important that we are to be pursuing holiness in the fear of God, we are to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Those are New Testament verses. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So what sin is hindering you from a powerful prayer life? I encourage you to confess it. Again, renounce it. Repent of it. Seek God's forgiveness and seek his grace to overcome it. 
We want to be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, our Lord. I encourage you not only to confess it, but to make no provision to satisfy the lust of the flesh, to, as the scripture says, mortify the deeds of the flesh, put them to an end, and pursue righteousness and holiness in the fear of God. Romans 8.12 says in 13, 14, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we, through the Spirit, do mortify, render useless, that's what it means, the deeds of the flesh or the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And I guarantee you the sons of God have a powerful prayer life. The sons of God have a powerful prayer life. When Peter and John, they heal the lame beggar at the gate beautiful in Acts 3.12. And Peter saw it and he answered unto the people. The people rose up and the people wanted to worship them because they had just healed the beggar. They thought they were gods. And he goes on to say, you men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so earnestly on us as though by our our own power or holiness, we had made this man to walk. Peter links holiness with the power of God resting upon our lives. Your personal holiness matters. The Lord is seeking to answer the prayer. His eyes are looking, and they run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal or perfect towards him. And finally, we see in James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. If you lack any wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men uh, liberally and without reproach, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering or without doubting. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed to and fro. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Instability. Instability paralyzes our prayer life. Instability. We need to be those that are, are stayed upon the Lord. I mean, what is your level of commitment to God? What is the level of your commitment to the scriptures? Have you really, truly dedicated yourself to the Lord? Not just once when you were 12 years old. How about yesterday? How about today? Lord, I, I give myself to you. I dedicate myself to you, to your plans and your purposes. That's something that we should be doing on a daily basis. I am yours, O oh Lord. I am thine, O oh God. And I give myself to you. I dedicate myself to you. Because Jesus told us a man cannot serve two masters, can he? You can be devoted to one and not the other. You can love one, but not the other. Who is really, truly on the throne of your life? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ or is it self? Self. I don't want us to leave this morning without realizing and without doing battle to these things that cripple us. Indifference, indulgence, iniquity, and instability. I don't want us to allow these things into our lives to rob us from God's blessing and God's power obtained through prayer. Moses in Exodus 14, 13, when they're facing sea and sword, he tells them, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of our Lord, which he will show you this day. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall not see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. We have been given access. We have been given permission to come before the Lord boldly, to find grace and mercy in the time of need. We need to take that opportunity and if there's one of those areas in our uh, lives that I had mentioned this morning that is keeping us back, we need to let God deal with it. We need to let God eradicate it from our lives. 
We need to ask God to eradicate it from our lives, right? We can make no provision for, to, uh, for sin in our lives, and we can put up all the boundaries and checkpoints and all of that to keep us from giving in to the flesh, but we need God to deal with that desire, to crush it, to eradicate it, to take it away from our lives. And one of the greatest things is that Jesus came not just to forgive us of our sin, but to take away our sin. And not just when we get in the by and by, but now. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to purge us. He wants to sanctify us, right, with the washing in the water of his word and his presence and his spirit. But we must be those that give ourselves wholeheartedly unto the Lord. Amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that and give thanks, so God, for you going to the cross to redeem us and to save us and deliver us. Lord, and to give us newness of life. Lord, I pray, Lord God Almighty, that you would continue to do the work that you started in each and every one of us. Lord, deliver us, O oh God, from indifference, indulgence, iniquity. Lord, deliver us, O oh God, from instability. May our feet be firmly planted upon the rock of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. May you deliver us, O oh God, from being babes in Christ. May we grow up and be mature and become the mature sons of God. And may it be evident in our lives, O oh God, that you are working in us and through us because of your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would arise, O oh Lord, and that those enemies of the flesh would flee. Lord, every area that we may be struggling in, Lord, we ask that you would drive out the enemy. Lord, that you would drive out the enemy, that you would wake, make your ways perfect, straight and smooth in our lives, O oh Lord, and that you would have your perfect way with us. Heavenly Father, we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.